live now yeah uh, good morning everyone and uh, we're delighted to be back with uh, 60 minutes of glaucoma as you know we've been doing this on a monthly basis and you know covid was an opportunity to begin something like this and the basic concept is that you have a guest uh, lecturer who's spent many years working on glaucoma and uh, is very passionate about his work actually so um, so that we can hear him speak uh, you know without any significant time limitation about uh, what he thinks about the work that he's doing and how he thinks we can all apply it to our practice and today we're very delighted to have dr surinder pandav who's the chief of glaucoma at the postgraduate institute in chandigarh and is also the president of glaucoma society of india uh, welcome, Dr. Surinder, and uh, I'll invite Dr. Shushmita Kaushik. Uh, I think she would know him very well, and uh, I'm sure she'd bring out some uh, great things about uh, Surinder that we uh, that we don't know. And uh, after that, I'd like to call on Dr. Chandrima Paul to just uh, say a few words of introduction, and then we can get on with uh, listening to Dr. Surinder speak. Dr. Shushmita. Oh dear! Now this is completely. <laughs> out of the blue box uh, talking about sir is i mean i i can take care of 60 minutes and then that's done <laughs> so he's he's been there as far as we can most of us can remember and he was always our go-to person even when he was overseas uh, i remember i can just share that we used to uh, send him our uh, problems and he would make drawings on paper and uh, you know what whatsapp them back or whatever send them back email them back so so uh, dr panda would be the best person to talk about uh, glaucoma and uh, we are very very eager to hear his experience and his wisdom through the ages which no amount of webinars and internet can uh, can garner for us so I'm very, very privileged to be here listening to him. Thank you, Dr. Chandrima. Uh, thank you, sir, for this invite. It's indeed an honor for me to be here with such stalwarts this morning. And uh, I think I would add another sentence to what Shushmita said, because I have been the secretary with uh, Dr. Pandav for the past one, two and a half months. And uh, I would say that he is uh, one of the most non-interfering and enthusiastic presidents that one could have. I'm indeed lucky to be on the same team with him. And uh, he's always there to encourage me. And uh, at all the webinars, like he's there to give solid academic support, which uh, I always look forward to. And uh, so far, so good. It has really been a wonderful experience. And the 60-minute glaucoma, I have been following it for a while and i think it's a great program you're doing and thank you very much once again for having me here uh, thank you thank you dr chandrima and dr surinder could we please uh, start your talk uh, thank you vinay for uh, this uh, inviting me because i have been actually been hosting this and today i am not hosting <laughs> i am a speaker uh, so thank you very much for this creating this platform and also actually sharing uh, with me uh, thank you, Sushmita and Chandrima, for your kind words. And uh, so I am yes. basically talking about how not to miss glaucoma in your practice. But this is a very important uh, and, uh, uh, and is important uh, as well. Okay. So what I'm saying is that glaucoma is basically blinding condition. Um, and there's no cure. So it's very important to diagnose in time and get this patient to your clinic. So the question is, uh, are we missing glaucoma? Uh, because that's what uh, is presumed in this topic. There's a lot of, uh, you know, glaucoma in the community actually, and we have close to 12 million people who have this uh, problem. Uh, but 90% uh, of glaucoma are been diagnosed. So obviously, we actually are missing at the community level. We are missing a lot of uh, glaucoma patients. So basically, the, because we are missing about 90% of the disease. So that means we need to, uh, and that 90% is in the community because these people are not coming to you. So the most important thing would be actually to get these people to your clinic. And how do we do that? Uh, I think there could be many reasons for this situation, but uh, the most important thing is that people are not aware of their problem. And for that reason, they need to be made aware. So patient education is actually is uh, the key in, in, in this area. We really don't want to miss a lot of glaucoma in the community. 
so we have been doing uh, you know some work at our end and uh, we all do it so but probably we need much more uh, than what uh, we are doing uh, as of now so do we miss glaucoma in the clinics i think that the answer to this question again is uh, emphatic yes because uh, the data from our country uh, from our the group of hospitals and also from abroad actually it suggests that uh, you could be we could be missing as much as 50 percent of uh, glaucoma in our clinic and this data suggests that in their patients all the new among the newly diagnosed patients when they went back to their histories they found that half of the patients were actually seen by a healthcare professional within the last one year but still the glaucoma was missed so that's another story in the clinics also we are missing uh, a lot of the disease uh, now the question uh, is uh, why do we miss glaucoma and the answer to this comes partly from uh, the chennai eye study uh, from uh, you know, shankar netale group where they found that uh, the lack of good clinical practices actually is uh, uh, quite prevalent and uh, uh, people do not follow as you know good protocol uh, where they have a proper uh, gonioscopy, a proper examination basically, which includes gonioscopy and optic disc evaluation. So all those things are not uh, uh, there as part of the routine examination. That might be one of the reasons that why uh, a lot of the trauma is missed. So question here is how not to miss glaucoma in a practice. And glaucoma is a silent disease. Uh, and uh, the best way not to uh, miss it is basically to examine the patients uh, carefully. And uh, because it's a clinical disease, so if you have a good clinical practice and if you are aware of the, you know, the, the methods of diagnosing glaucoma clinically, I think uh, uh, that can help you. Uh, so that's, that's the most important thing that we have. Uh, the thing is that uh, how we can do it practically. I mean, in a, in a clinical situation where we are practicing, how we can um, ensure that your clinical practices are good and you don't miss glaucoma. So basically, uh, you know, how not to miss, I'll just give you seven tips or you can also call seven tips of people uh, not to miss glaucoma. So the most important thing would be to never miss an opportunity to do opportunity screening. So we know glaucoma is actually a silent disease and it, you know, people don't know about it. So they won't know that they have a disease unless you tell them that they have a problem uh, in the eye. And also this doesn't, glaucoma doesn't reveal itself very readily to the physicians either. So unless you're looking for it, uh, you will not know the patient has glaucoma. So whenever patient comes to you, uh, I think, think from glaucoma point of view, for the patient may, may have come for the refraction or for uh, itching of the eyes or for whatever reason. I think that's a good opportunity for all the ophthalmologists who are dealing with, uh, you know, eye care, uh, not to miss glaucoma. So that actually, I think, is the most important step, first step towards uh, not missing glaucoma. And the uh, next slide would be the the second tip would be the would be to uh, you know some, do some kind of a risk profiling now you can't screen all glaucoma patients so even if they're all, all of them coming to the clinic still it's not possible so better to do whenever a patient is visiting do some kind of a screen uh, risk profiling of the patient uh, there's a low risk or a high risk for glaucoma and at least all the high risk uh, group people they should be screened and the risk uh, uh, that could be the base on their data like that we know that there is an age related problem so if the age is more than 40 years they are would be at a higher risk and as the age goes up to 70s 80s the risk increases uh, similarly you have a family history you have myopia and uh, if you find the cornea is thin and to that you can also add other uh, diseases uh, like conditions like uveitis trauma previous surgery systemic uh, conditions cardiovascular conditions so basically you have to look at the overall profile of the patient and uh, categorize in some way that is the risk of glaucoma high or it's low so at least uh, all those people who are visiting the clinic and have a little higher risk profile they should be screened for glaucoma uh, the third would be to follow good clinical practice so uh, that is already uh, mentioned and uh, we must have gonioscopic disc evaluation uh, must be there for the routine uh, evaluation for all these patients. Uh, of course, we will do the IOP, CCT, and detailed examination and go into details of the history and also, uh, you know, overcome the hurdles which may be in the form of cataract or small people, but they should not be excused. 
not to do it incomplete examination. The examination has to be uh, complete, and that's how we'll get to get all uh, these patients. So, optic disc evaluation number four, because never ignore this, uh, and this is actually the fundamental. Uh, and here I will actually digress a little bit. Okay, so optic disc evaluation is basically the key. Uh, and uh, that, that's the place we have to look for it. Uh, the reason is that uh, uh, optic, uh, the glaucoma is based in optic neuropathy and uh, optic nerve head is the place where we uh, would uh, look for these things. Um, so the reason is that because there's a high accuracy of uh, disc evaluation and uh, if you look at the, the clinical accuracy of optic disc evaluation, uh, the overall diagnostic accuracy in the hands of good the trained ophthalmologists is close to 80 to 90 percent. Uh, that's that, that's actually fairly accurate. And uh, if you compare it with the other, uh, you know, the disc evaluation methods like the, the technological methods. So yes. if you look at the HRT, OCT, GDX, and if you have an experienced observer there, uh, as you can see, the Clinical evaluation actually is as good or as even better uh, uh, than uh, you know any of these methods uh, of evaluation that we have. As as you can see, the if, if you're looking at the DDL, DDLS based classification uh, for the optic disc evaluation, and if you're looking at all you know the uh, the nerve fibrillar based parameters on these uh, investigative tools, uh, the observer uh, actually clinical observer actually does better uh, job of detecting glaucoma in these. Uh, in these eyes. So the question is why clinicians are superior uh, to all the digital technology that we have uh, this year. Now this is because uh, we human beings are very good in rec recognizing patterns, and uh, uh, you know you know our survival as a human race has actually depended on recognition of these patterns in nature. So you recognize which patterns are friendly, which are not so friendly, and that helps you survive. And also. You see so many, you know, you see so many faces every day, you know, and just you meet so many people. But once you know somebody, you can recognize them without actually even thinking for a split second. So it comes instant instantaneously. So I ask many times, you know, the, what this pattern I'm showing on screen is, and invariably the answer is always correct. They always come up with the correct answer that is a tiger. This is because even from a small pattern, uh, we, we can actually in, infer. Uh, you know what we are looking at. So, so the pattern recognition is actually in our genes, whereas the mathematics computers they have come much later. So they are getting smarter, but still they it will take time before they you know come to that level. So I think we can all uh, use that. Uh, we are, we all use in clinical practice to actually to that that ability to recognize patterns. Uh, the 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 biggest drawback is that it's a subjective. So you want to have a comparative for comparison. You want to have numbers. And those numbers are not there uh, with this method. So for the initial diagnosis, this is actually a very good, good tool, but for a comparative purpose, it may not be, uh, that's where there are some problems. And that's the reason we need uh, other uh, techniques uh, you know, to do this. You know, there's a wide range of appearances. Like there are so many people, you may find different people, you recognize them, but you don't recognize all of them. You only recognize people that you have met earlier. So there's a caveat here. So you only recognize patterns that you are familiar with. So if there are a lot of, uh, you know, appearance, there are different appearance of the optic nerve, this also, nerve head also. And to recognize them, you have to be familiar uh, with those patterns, those, uh, you know, normal as well as glucometrous patterns. And that's where this, you know, this skill development occurs. That's where the familiarity uh, has to build up. That's where the practice uh, comes in handy. So this the practice is the key here basically that you have to look at these patterns so that you can recognize them easily so be familiar with the glaucoma package so that is actually the that's the tip here that you have to be familiar with the you know normal patterns as well as glaucoma related patterns and because the disc appearance could be very different different situations now to be familiar with the patterns and to interpret them correctly uh, it's very important to understand the, the anatomy of the underlying uh, the structure uh, that you are seeing. Now, optic disc comes in very you know different shapes and sizes. It also comes in uh, you know there may be a large disc, small disc, tilted disc, uh, you know very crowded disc. 
Now all these this they they look different, but they have a basis in the in their anatomy. So if you understand the anatomy of the optic nerve head and what kind of appearance is it is likely to produce, that can help you decide whether the appearance that you're looking at is glaucomatous or it is just a normal anatomical variation and that's why the appearance is different. So you have to be mindful of the underlying anatomy which is it may not be readily apparent, but you have to deduct it from the clinical appearance. And with that understanding, it may be, you know, much easier to decide whether uh, the patient has a glaucoma, a glaucoma or it doesn't have a glaucoma. Now, to give you an example, this is 54 years old male. Are you seeing that face? So this has a normal visual equity and the IOP is 20-20. CCT is okay. Uh, but there's a family history of glaucoma in this patient. Now, in this situation, uh, what would be the, you know, is it glaucoma or is not glaucoma? And we come across uh, this kind of things quite often, actually. Uh, and you have to make a decision here. So how will you interpret uh, this field? And sometimes it may not be very easy to say whether it's definitely, you know, it may not be very categorically apparent that is normal or it's not normal. So in that case, Basically, whenever you see a patient, you are asking yourself a question, what is the probability or what is the possibility that what you are looking at would be, would be a glucometer change? And uh, so this question always has to be there in the back of your mind. And to answer this question, there are a number of ways to look at the optic nerves. And uh, you have that AMLI, AMLI classification, you know, that's the standard textbook teaching, basically. So we are all familiar with uh, these things, and you also have you know, then a number of tools are available now on the internet and also on different uh, websites. Also, Seagig has its own series of slides. Or DDL is another system of looking at the optic nerves more objectively, optic discs more objectively, and uh, and lead you to some conclusion that the this you are looking at could be glaucomatous or it is normal. Now the problem with all these methods is basically uh, is it's very time consuming. I mean, the, there's a learning curve to it. Okay, so th this I talked about, there are many ways of doing it, but uh, uh, again, um, uh, you know, you, you had to figure out what, you know, suits you the best, what you like the best, and, uh, uh, you know, um, so you had to familiar with one of them or all of them so that you can make uh, uh, a considered uh, opinion. This is uh, this is uh, unpublished data because this is very heterogeneous data has been drawn from a very large population, 5,000 5, observers of different grades of training. And what we looked at was that uh, for a medical, if, a, if you are a medical student, uh, you know, uh, fresh from the college, uh, 50 to 60 percent of cases you will be able to make a, a, a reasonably good diagnosis of glaucoma. Uh, but when you go to experts, they can go up to 80 to 90 percent. But this increase from 50 to 80 or 90 percent actually takes very long time. So it takes years of training before you get, you know, familiar with all the glaucoma patterns, all the normal patterns, and normal patterns. Uh, the best way to shorten it is uh, to do practice or you kind of design, uh, devise your own uh, way of looking at it, or improve upon your skills uh, of, uh, you, you know, looking at it. And that's where the and because this is a very long process, so that's why where the technology is actually, you know, being used more and more with the hope that it, will, it can cut down this period. But uh, unfortunately, as of now, we're still depending on the clinical examination and we still have to go through that uh, training process. Uh, for me, the simpler way to look at is uh, uh, look for what is most important. Now, when we are looking at the optic nerve head, there are many things there. Uh, you know, many structures there, but uh, they're all important. But from functional point of view, if you look at it, uh, from the vision point of view, is the what is the most important thing? The most important thing remains the neural tissue. Now you have an optic uh, nerve head here, and it shows a very nice, uh, you know, pink optic disc with some cup, and you have a nice nerve fiber layer around it. So nerve fiber layer and neural dental ring are the representatives of the neural tissue in the eye. So basically, when you are looking at an optic nerve, uh, the, your focus should be on the neural tissue there, and mentally you will need to uh, you know kind of delineate this tissue from other structures so if you can isolate the rim tissue and the nerve fiber layer from other structures uh, then you will be able to assess these two structures uh, in a more objective manner is 
you know, it's still subjective, but your accuracy will be will be kind of higher. So if you're looking at the optic nerve head, then make sure that you mentally uh, dissect this the neuro tissue, which is the most important, and and that's basically look at it. And once you have isolated the neuro tissue, uh, you would like to know whether this is enough neuro tissue there or deficient. Uh, in glaucoma, it be deficient. Or uh, is it properly distributed? There may be some neuro tissue there enough, uh, but it may be missing at certain key points. So the distribution of the tissue may not be uh, accurate or may not be uh, normal. And also, is there any evidence that there's a disease? Because the tissue may be there, but it may not be healthy. So if the, if the answer to all these questions is no, then there's a normal disease. But if any of the answers is, uh, is uh, if, if yes, if, if answer is yes, then that means you are your is better. But if any of the, there's a, uh, if there's a uh, tissue there, if there's a loss there, or there's a inadequacy of the inadequacy of the rim or uh, distribution or some evidence of disease, that means we might be dealing with the disc which is glucometers. So the key skill basically here is when you are delineating the neural tissue, the key skill would be uh, to define the limits of the neural tissue. And that means you have to figure out where the outer inner uh, edge of the spiral canal is, where the inner edge of the, the neural rim is, and uh, and also how to detect the nerve fibrillar defects. So these are the three key skills uh, which have to be mastered uh, if you want to be good at, you know, determining how the, the uh, to be good at diagnosing glaucoma. So because this is normal, a lot of normal variability is there. Now, you can see three discs now. Now all the three discs are actually normal, but they look very different because their underlying anatomy is different. One is small uh, with a tilt, the other one is normal, middle one is normal, the, the regular disc, and the last one is a large disc. Now, an inexperienced observer can actually confuse these discs for, you know, disease disc if you're not careful. But if you look at the neural tissue, if you delineate the neural tissue, now if you look at the delineated margin, then you realize that the questions to all those four, three, uh, uh, answer to all those three questions is actually is is yes. So there's enough tissue is properly distributed, and there's not any evidence of any disease uh, in this. And the nerve fiber layer, the fourth is actually uh, in the middle one is easy to say it's normal. Uh, in others, it may not be that easy, but there's definitely no you know uh, no clearly visible nerve fiber layer defect is there in these either. So that based on these findings, one can say that these are normal. Now, the, there could be many confounders like this size, you know, shape, peripheral atrophy, like you are seeing in these patients, in these images. So that has to be kept in mind. So you have to factor out, factor out the confounders and then you make a judgment about the neural tissue, whether it's healthy, is adequate, and if it is properly uh, distributed. Now, there are sometimes there may be an, enough neural tissue there. Uh, you can see there's a lot of pink, uh, uh, in the rim in these eyes, but uh, it's missing at the crucial point. Now, these, these kind of patterns, these is what we have to recognize. These are very typical glaucoma patterns. And uh, you can see if you uh, delineate them, if you, you know, draw the outlines of these, the neural tissue in these discs, uh, you can see there is a, you know, in the first picture, there's a sphere as an inferior notching and other two also show a sphere or inferior notching. And also there are adjacent nerve fibrillar defects. So these are the patterns which are actually very peculiar to glaucoma, and this is what we have to uh, be, uh, you know, kind of a look for. And the next is the is the neural tissue healthy? Yeah. So I think if you look at the first uh, top, uh, you know, uh, slide on the left side is kind of pale, this uh, segmental pallor. So this is definitely not a normal. This may or may not be glaucoma. But then, and the next one you, you can again see there's a bit of. Uh, you know, uh, abnormality of the rim tissue there inferiorly, and also uh, there's a peripheral atrophy there, and the, there's a disc hemorrhage, and the one on the you know left hand side and below actually shows a lot of peripheral atrophy. But if you look more carefully at the rim tissue, it, it looks quite healthy. So in spite of the PPA, uh, this this uh, the rim is healthy. So rim rim tissue is not showing any abnormality here. There in others you can say there's a some evidence that 
you know there's a tissue is not healthy now ppa itself is not a uh, is a disease or it's not it doesn't mean glaucoma but ppa is more often associated with glaucoma so whenever you see ppa you kind of you know have to uh, consider the possibility of glaucoma but be careful that all ppas may not be glaucoma so if you look at this disc now you know there's a very uh, you know good amount of neuro tissue there the color is good there's no evidence of uh, any disease uh, but the, the disc Stuff is deep, and you can see the lamina, the the pores and laminar pores are uh, visible. So that kind of makes you think whether this is normal or this abnormal could be a normal disc. So if you dissect this uh, disc, you know now if you just delineate the the rim area, uh, you'll find the rim tissue is quite healthy, quite regular. There's no notching. Uh, the distribution is good. There's no uh, you know nothing to suggest. So basically. Uh, there's nothing to suggest glaucoma in this in in this patient. So what would 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 this be glaucoma? It's normal. It's not a clearly normal. You'll find that something is unusual about this this. But is it glaucoma? So glaucoma is probably unlikely. So that's how you can actually classify your disc whether glaucoma is a is is a possibility in this or not. So that will help you decide take the future action where what you want to do with this uh, this. Okay, so because this disc is obviously now, if you look at this disc, uh, it's a large cup, very thin neuroretinal rim. Uh, the rim is actually missing, and in the periphery uh, area, there's an atrophy there. So this this has a lot of uh, signs, uh, you know, a lot of evidence to suggest. And if you look at the rim, there's hardly any rim uh, on the temporal side, and even the spherical area is missing. So if you're seeing this kind of a rim pattern, you actually don't. You know, need even to more investigation for this patient from di from glaucoma diagnosis uh, point of view. So this disc is almost certainly glaucoma, and you know there won't be any con confusion uh, as far as diagnosis is concerned. So if you look at this disc now, uh, this disc uh, you know can be you know this is smaller disc actually. So if you miss that point, then there would be a uh, you know error in the diagnosis. So if you delineate the rim, it looks good. Uh, there's a enough rim tissue there, but inferiorly there's a little thinning, and also you can see there's a, inferiorly there's a nerve fiber thinning is there. Now, when you put these, uh, you know, finally when you look at, you know, these things together, uh, your probability of glaucoma in this patient really goes up. So glaucoma is possible at this stage. You can't commit to this. That this is certainly a glaucoma, but this definitely is not a normal disc, and you, at least you have a subtle. Uh, no, you know, thinning of the inferior rim inferiorly, and also, you know, some very subtle thinning of the nerve fiber layer. Uh, so that that probably, you know, make it a possible glaucoma. And this patient needs to be uh, this patient needs to be studied further. You need to do visual fees and other things. For this patient. So that's how it helps you in decision making. Okay, so if you look at this disc now, this is again a small disc. It shows a peripheral atrophy around it. And you can see there is, a, if you if you're not careful, it's easy to miss the cup in this, uh, you know, the which is large, is almost 0.7 uh, in this disc. And if you're not careful, you'll probably miss the inferior notch uh, in this patient. So if you delineate the rim, on the other hand, if you if you just dissect out the rim tissue, uh, the neural tissue, and you'll find that there is actually is a very thin rim there. There's a notch inferiorly, and that also has a corresponding nerve fibrillar defect. Now, if this is the picture, uh, then the diagnosis would certainly be glaucoma in this patient. So it's likely glaucoma or certainly glaucoma. Uh, if you still have doubt, you can still say it's a likely glaucoma. Uh, and if it's not certainly glaucoma, and you will definitely like to investigate uh, this patient further. So this patient, again, is it uh, glaucoma or not? Okay, so this disc is again looks a little weird, it looks suspicious. So that's why this was investigated. So for this, this what we did was we did the, all this, uh, the IOP is 20, CCT is good. There's a family history and OCT, HRT were normal in, in this disc. So this would have been passed as normal. Uh, however, we also did the visual fields uh, for this patient and you can see, is the field visible to you now? You can see, the VFI is 100%, uh, MD is actually on the positive side, not on the negative side, and the PST is good, and there's very normal limits. So 
field is also within normal limits as for the statistics but if you look carefully there is one uh, spot there. are you seeing that the field field yes sir okay so you can see there is a spot here uh, there's a you know uh, the missed point here and all depressed point here and also there are two uh, another adjacent this uh, depressed point so so this actually is filling in this criteria even though the visual field statistics that can show that this is normal visual fields but if you look at visual inspection on the pattern deviation plot you are seeing that there is actually is a small you know depressed point which fulfills the criteria technically now if you go back to the fundus picture again so here the field is shown as normal by the machine and all the investigation normal but if you look at the disc more carefully again uh, you'll see that uh, then if you delineate the now if you delineate the neural tissue so where is the neural tissue you can see there's a good amount of neural tissue inferiorly but severely because the vascular anomaly is uh, you know a little bit difficult to ascertain but just by the side of it you there's a bit of it you know the vessel is bending you know towards the rim and you can see there's a bit of uh, uh, there's a uh, thinning the neural tissue and adjacent to this thinning you have a thinning of the nerve fiber layer as well so when you put this together you have a thinning of the neural tissue and you have also a, you know defect in the nerve fiber layer uh, your glaucoma suspicion goes up so from you know normal to it will probably go you know to likely glaucoma or something you know you know that like so again so that way you can actually uh, you know study these uh, optic nerves okay so basically this was the fourth point that the disc evaluation is very important and what i have uh, basically the, the diverted a little bit just to give you that how uh, i uh, you, you know uh, how people look at the optic uh, disc and what is the basis for examining the optic disc and how like uh, i like to see the focus on the neural rim uh, neural tissue basically which is the most important thing so uh, coming back to the habits for not missing glaucoma yeah so what we have discussed is like never miss an opportunity to uh, you know to um, to do opportunity screening uh, glaucoma risk assessment for your patients so that so that high risk glaucoma are not missed uh, you have good good clinical practice uh, follow the good clinical practices and optic disc evaluation is very critical now after this the next would be uh, to, uh, to be aware of the common errors that uh, may happen while you're examining the optic discs and also when you are uh, uh, you know what is the impact of these errors so essentially you can make two types of the errors you can have errors which lead to underdiagnosis or you can have errors which lead to overdiagnosis so that you have to be aware uh, of you know the pitfalls that you have so errors that lead to underdiagnosis of glaucoma are kind of a now this is from the gone project actually we we looked at all the images all the responses and we found that if people were not deleting the sterile ring correctly or if they were ignoring the this size uh, if they are missing the si small size of the disc, particularly if the rim notch was missed, or if there is a hemorrhage which was missed, and if the nerve failure defect not taken into account, so these are the five errors which are common, and they are associated with underdiagnosis of glaucoma. So these are very important actually to focus. So that's why you focus on the neural rim, and you focus on any abnormalities of the rim, and you will not miss uh, you know these findings. Uh, and then that way you can minimize the errors. And also, if you make these errors, you are likely to underdiagnose the disease. But on the other hand, if you have, uh, you know, uh, some of the errors, they can also make you overdiagnose diagnose the disease. And the large disc is well known for that. But you can also have hypoplastic disc or uh, congenital anomalies or coloboma, uh, you know, which can be uh, mistaken for glaucoma. So. And other thing is that if you have a peripapillary atrophy, you know, peripapillary atrophy has an association with glaucoma, but as I said, all PPAs are not glaucoma. So when you see extensive papillary, peripapillary atrophy, and if the patient is also myopic, you are a little biased towards glaucoma diagnosis. So I think that bias has to be balanced when you're making a diagnosis. So that can also create a, you know, error towards the diagnosis of glaucoma that can happen. And also, we have a little bias in giving a negative diagnosis. So whenever you are when you are not sure, you are seeing something on the optic nerve, you think it could be glaucoma, 
but you always hesitate in you know uh, telling the patient that you have a disease because uh, it has a negative uh, you know repercussions so i think we have to be aware of our own our own biases as well uh, while giving uh, you know the diagnosis uh, to the, when examining this patient and uh, kind of a, give a unbiased try to give an unbiased kind of a uh, opinion for uh, these patients uh, the sixth uh, important point is habit would be that be aware uh, of the frequently missed glaucoma phenotypes so you can miss glaucoma on the uh, you know miss certain findings make some errors but there you have to be aware that there are certain glaucoma phenotypes which are actually very uh, which are prone to uh, you know uh, miss misdiagnosis and an angle closure is one of them so unless you do a good bronchoscopy uh, you might miss you because when the patient comes to you the pressure may be normal uh, the IOP may be IOP may be normal and if you don't have a good look at the optic disc you might miss and if you don't do bronchoscopy then you miss the angle closure similarly the normal tension glaucoma if the pressure is also normal so if you're depending only on the IOP then you like to miss this and also uh, pseudo exfoliation glaucoma uh, they the IOPs fluctuate a lot and uh, um, you know they can come with the advanced damage uh, if you miss your exfoliation so they need to be followed and similarly if you have a pigment dispersus, dispersus syndrome and there may be other other features actually who uh, that you know the many other phenotypes uh, that if you're not careful you can uh, miss them and the tip is that use technology for your advantage so to confirm the diagnosis uh, and to documentation and for monitoring uh, on a follow-up uh, follow-up this patient technology is very important uh, at least you need a visual field Humphreys or equivalent visual fields to, to confirm the diagnosis and also monitor these patients on and a lot of things are actually happening on uh, on this uh, uh, on the technology front so I think more exciting things are coming up in the you know, visual fields which are more portable they can be done more easily uh, you know and also uh, the documentation is becoming easier and also there are many other algorithms to pick up glaucoma artificial intelligence and a lot of things are coming but from practice point of view uh, the basic clinical examination and at least one with you know good uh, parameter uh, is, a, is is essential and with this you can actually uh, diagnose and treat most of the glaucoma patients well so to summarize, glaucoma is uh, very is largely undiagnosed conditions. Uh, we miss a lot of glaucoma in the community and also in our clinics. And the emphasis uh, emphasis at this point should be not to miss to get people from the community and not to miss them in the clinic. And for that, clinical examination is very good. Uh, good clinical practice are required. Uh, pay attention to the people who are at risk. And optic nerve head evaluation is actually the key to the glaucoma diagnosis because most often the first suspicion about glaucoma comes from the optic nerve evaluation and also be aware of the pitfalls in the glaucoma diagnosis the errors that we can make and also what the, what would the impact of the, that error on the glaucoma diagnosis uh, thank you very much so thank you very much and uh, we'd like to open the uh, the talk for questions uh, I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Sundar Pandav and uh, also uh, my guests, my co-chairman, uh, you know, uh, the optic disc is so important for the assessment of glaucoma. And, um, uh, you know, if you just had access to uh, to the slit lamp and to the 70 adapter lens and you were examining the patient with uh, dilated pupils, is that enough to uh, assess the optic disc or you would say, no, I'm, I have to depend on the color photographs, you know, because there's a big difference in looking at a color photograph in front of you and just, you know, the transient view that you get of the optic disc with the patient moving, the reflexes and things like that, you know. So how would you suggest that we make use of the optic disc parameter uh, merely on clinical examination or do you think that taking a photograph and looking at the photograph is really important? I think this is important because if the if the media is good and people is uh, you know and the people is dilated, uh, you you can actually diagnose glaucoma. But clinically, all patients on you know, the media is, is not good. There will be some cataract uh, because the age group is such, and they tend to have small people also. So uh, it's, it's very helpful actually, and especially there are certain findings which are known to be missed on slit lamp 
uh, and more often picked on these photographs, disc hemorrhages, for instance. So somehow disc hemorrhages uh, are prone to be missed on slit lamp, and uh, also a very subtle nerve fiber uh, layer could be missed because you are uh, look in a, with a 90D, you are actually looking in a, on the optic nerve head, you know, very uh, on the uh, uh, the, the focus is on the optic nerve head and the peripapillary area is uh, somewhat uh, is can get ignored. So if you are doing consciously, if you are you know looking at these things, then then still the examination is as good. You dilate the pupil and do a you know look at the neural tissue and look at the peripapillary uh, area and look for those at hemorrhages and defects. Uh, you, you can you can pick up most of the, the comma, but. Uh, now, having said that, if you have a backup, uh, you know, fundus picture, uh, you many times you will find additional, uh, you know, uh, features on the on the on the fundus picture as well. So I think it, this photograph is actually is a great uh, help if if it's available to you. But um, you can pick up all these findings actually on clinical examination as well. So uh, I would say these pictures are supplementary to, you know, your clinical examination definitely. Uh, uh, Dr. Shmita, Dr. Chandrima, would you like to say something? And yeah, I guess I... the other, sorry, the other yeah. utility, of course, would be uh, if you had these pictures uh, when the patient got in to see what it, what the change is like, would be also an additional thing. So that would be an additional reason to also supplement a current examination yeah. now, especially if patients are going to be brought in again. Yes. Yes. Uh, uh, Ch Chandra, do you want to? Yeah, I, I do a stereoscopic uh, photograph because that serves as a baseline when the patient is coming in for follow up or uh, maybe after a few years. So I definitely do a stereoscopic photograph of the disc along with my clinical examination. Um, uh, I also wanted to, you know, uh, uh, th this uh, 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 this concept about just focusing on the neuroretinal rim. Uh, you know, uh, that's really, really a very exciting actually to, I've never thought of it in that way because we just look at the rim along with everything else, you know, and so the attention of your brain is divided for all the different things, but you're saying just focus on the neuroretinal rim and its shape. And how do you do that actually? Do you have, uh, you know, do you have a special software that you delineate the rim and that shifts the rim aside or and allowing you to focus on the rim or it's just something that you uh, want to ask all of us to train ourselves while looking at the color photograph or while uh, looking clinically at the optic disc actually i think as of now there's no reliable software for this uh, the automated segmentation algorithms uh, have been tried uh, and uh, people are still uh, working on that uh, maybe someday we might have it uh, uh, is is probably better done on OCT images so because there you there still you have you know the automated segmentation is still uh, better than on a color photograph but that's kind of a different area but here what I'm uh, sort of emphasizing is that when you're looking clinically uh, on the strip lamp or on a disc photograph I think there we kind of train ourselves so as I said there are three key skills here uh, three things which are very important one is to determine the outer limit of the neuroretinal rim. That means uh, we have to determine where the scleral canal is, the inner edge of the scleral canal is. So that's the most important landmark and many times we make, a, make an error there. Uh, that is still not too difficult with practices comes. Uh, the second difficult part is the defining the inner edge of the rim because the inner edge of the rim is not always as smooth, especially uh, if the cup is very shallow, then you don't know and in myopic eyes, It'll be very hard to define where the inner edge of the rim is. So there we depend on you know kind of clues that we have. So we have different kind of clues there. So one is one, and the more reliable one is probably the bending of the vessel. So we look at the force of the vessel on the opt optic disc surface, and wherever there's a you know bend which suggests that it's climbed over you know over a raised uh, you know hill. So that would be taken kind of a, that gives us a idea where is. Uh, the other thing would be is also that the dispeller. Uh, the dispeller also somewhat is, you know, tells you where the rim would be and where the cup is. But again, that's not very reliable. There would be a mismatch in the, in the cup and the peller. And that's why you depend on the, the vascular bending of the, you know, sign. So if you're looking at on a 3D image, then it's a little easier. And when you're looking at 2D uh, image, then it's a little difficult. 
and third of course is the focusing clues so if the that helps if, if the, the cup is deep uh, then you know the deeper part are not as well focused as the superficial part would be focused and that also uh, helps you uh, you know dis uh, distinguish where the rim tissue is or how much thickness of the rim tissue is now these things are better seen if, if you have a a 3D viewing system, but even in a 2D viewing system, in a flat uh, color image, uh, you can, uh, you know, with a good uh, accuracy, you can uh, define uh, where these structures are. But that's kind of the skill that we have to learn. So how to delineate the neural tissue from everything else? So it's like how to find grain in a, you know, haystack or in a shaft or whatever. So so is that kind of a thing? So there are other things. There are atrophy. There are blood vessels. Now, something other things might be happening uh, but if you can delineate the rim tissue then it's easy so it's kind of a mental exercise that you delineate where the neural tissue is so and then you make an assessment about the neural tissue you know whether it's good is enough it's not enough is the disease is properly distributed so those few things and then that helps you make up your mind whether the this you are looking at is potentially glaucoma or it's normal so again, it, there's no mathematics here, but it's just kind of a, you have to train yourself for, for this. Uh, 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 can, uh, uh, Shushmita, can you take up uh, the next two questions? Uh, uh, you can see the questions. One is by Ravi Matani on the ATM and gonioscopy. And so, uh, yeah, so, so one of them is uh, which vessel will actually demarcate the neural tissue? I think what he means is, uh, the circumlinear vessel probably which one so superior inferior nasal which one will demarcate there is no one vessel actually but the circumlinear uh, vessel has, because it's kind of traversing along the rim and if there's something goes wrong with the rim if it thins out then that vessel will become you know it'll stand out it'll be separate from the neural tissue so that's kind of a optically it's easy to distinguish so there's no one vessel otherwise so if you have a circumlinear vessel it's easy sometimes they don't have any circumlinear vessels so in that case you look at the smaller vessels which are traversing that this surface and see their course whether they are uh, showing any bending because a vessel when it goes from the floor to goes up the rim it will show a little you know change in its course and that can be detected uh, and the next one is uh, what is the importance of the isnt rule is it always true or yeah. i think the rule is good I, again it, it, it you know, basically tells you the distribution uh, of the of, uh, of the neural tissue in the optic disc so as i said the distribution is important and the normal distribution is like inferior rim is thicker uh, then is the superior then is the nas uh, nasal and then the nipple so this is the usual configuration but as i said because this is not universal so if you have a this which is anatomically different so if you have a disc which is rotated or tilted or you know pit or coloboma, then this rule will not be applicable. So in that situation, having abnormal ISNT will not make it to the common. So so that's why it's very important to understand the underlying anatomy uh, because sometimes anatomy may not be certain what's happening deeper. You don't really know, and that can in affect the appearance of the optic. You know what what you see on surface. So for that reason, you focus on the rim. Uh, and uh, see whether uh, the neural tissue and see whether there's any uh, you know defect in that so that that's that's where uh, this approach would be handy but if you have a regular disc and if there's a isnt rule which is not followed then definitely you have a pointer and this basically says that your rim tissue is uh, thinner uh, in a place where it should not be thinner so that's what isnt means so this is actually the same thing uh, kind of i'm putting it differently so ISNT rule definitely applicable, but not for all eyes. Gonioscopy um, is, uh, when will you suggest gonioscopy yeah. in your routine OPD patients? So gonioscopy is, uh, I think, a part of the test which should be made available even by the comprehensive ophthalmologists because that's how we are missing glaucoma and that's how uh, we underdiagnose glaucoma. So definitely gonioscopy should be made a part of comprehensive examination. Gonioscopy is not that difficult and can be learned very easily. So I would advise gonioscopy in all patients on a routine basis. Would you like to add to that? Uh, 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 Surinder, do you want to say something? 
I think I think Chandra has already said it. Uh, the gonoscopy is actually part of the good clinical practice. That's what I'm saying. And uh, uh, we know the angle closure glaucoma is this one phenotype which is often missed. And also important to remember is that angle closure glaucoma is more blinding than open angle glaucoma, almost three times more blinding. So, so angle closure glaucoma is more prone to be missed, is more damaging. Therefore, it should not be it should not be missed in your practice. And for that. The safeguard is actually the gonioscopy for that. So if you're doing gonioscopy, then you can classify the angles and you can you know, find patients who are at risk of angle closure or who are having angle closure. So they can be uh, you know, segregated and uh, you know, paid attention to. So gonioscopy definitely is part, uh, not only when you are suspecting angle closure, but for all glaucoma patients. Even if you want to say the angle is open, if you want to say it's in POAG, uh, you have to say the angle is open. And how, how can you say that unless you're done doing this working? Um, is there any other so question? When, uh, when will you? Uh, th no, that's done. What, what how often? Is, the law? is that the one? How often will you advise HFA in moderate to advanced glaucoma? Yes. Yes. Uh, well, uh, moderate to advanced glaucoma A is that the risk factors count a lot. And if there are high risk factors, then definitely maybe quarterly in a year, at least three times every quarter the patient comes back. Uh, that is it basically. But the risk factors would be a very important, uh, would play a very important part in deciding uh, the follow up visits. Would you like to add to it? Um, yeah, so maybe our uh, our standard is actually uh, if it's a disc suspect or ocular hypertension and we are sure the fields are reliable, we call them in annually. And for early glaucomas, sorry? The question is moderate to advanced glaucoma. Yeah, so moderate to advanced, moderate glaucomas actually six six to eight months if they're okay. I mean, it, moderate glaucoma, I assume, is between minus six and minus 12. That's the usual cutoff. So we usually do it about baby because we can't afford to have quicker ones. I mean, we would love to have three times a year, but at least twice a year, maybe six to eight months is where we land up with, but definitely not. But advanced glaucomas are the one where, which take up all the time on the visual fields because, um, you must understand that it has a floor effect both for visualization as well as for structural imaging. So frequently it's the functional which really guides you as to whether they're doing. And in fact, not just the visual fields and advanced glaucomas, it's important to even ask, are you the same in your routine work? Do you feel a little different? Because when the sensitivity is going down, they would say that the acuity is six by nine, but I don't feel the same. So that's another point in just, uh, so the advanced glaucoma take up, yes, more time, about three to four monthly maybe. As she said. So, so there's another question from Dr. Shripal uh, Bhattiwala, and you know, this is, <clears throat> this is so important. Every, all of us uh, face this, you know, which is your uh, cut out lower age limit? You know, what's the lower age limit for intraocular measurement? in routine uh, OPD patients. Surinder? I think uh, IOP, uh, we do for all our patients, you know, all the all our patients actually who are visiting uh, the, the clinic, uh, except probably for small children who will not cooperate. Uh, but from glaucoma point of view, you know, everyone above 40 years of age should be screened for glaucoma. So that includes a good examination, intraocular pressure measurements, and you know the disc evaluation and gonioscopy. So whenever a patient is visiting you, 40 plus patient, uh, I think all this should be done for those patients. Okay. Uh, so I, I I want to take you back to one of the slides, uh, you know, uh, which which you know of course is a it's it's a very important slide for all of us that when you're young. You can reach a diagnosis of 60% with the optic disc, and then after that, it takes 10 to 15 years to reach a diagnosis uh, based on the optic disc of glaucoma. So, if I if I said that if you added automated perimetry to a young ophthalmologist who's able to make 
60% of the diagnosis, uh, you know, based on the optic disc. If you added perimetry to it, you know, where would that go to? And if you added perimetry to, uh, to the 80% diagnosis that someone with 10 to 15 years of experience reaches, you know, at what level can we diagnose glaucoma? What is the percentage of correct glaucoma diagnosis that we would get actually? So what's the role of adding perimetry to optic disc evaluation in being able to diagnose glaucoma? I think in this uh, the in this the, the data is from Gon project. Uh, this is this is a little heterogeneous data basically. So uh, that means that um, you know there are very different kind of uh, you know people with many different kind of experiences. So they have actually done this, including some nurses and medical students and optometrists. Uh, so uh, the, the your question is that if you, I mean this was purely based on the optic disc examination. The reason was that the optic disc is probably the first thing that you will see in a, uh, when you are evaluating for glaucoma and the perimetry and other things would come later. So unless you suspect clinically, you may not be actually doing perimetry. So it's very important to have a, a good disc evaluation. Now coming to that, how much will it add you know, to the diagnosis? Uh, I don't think there's a good data on that, but if you if you are uh, if you notice, uh, I think on WGA there's a, another very similar program is going on on World Glaucoma Association website is there. So there uh, they have put up the same similar pictures to what we have in the GON. Probably some picture might be the same. I'm not sure, but there's a very large number of discs are there, uh, and they have that perimetry with that and. Uh, you know, few OCT with that. So if you have this picture, OCT and perimetry. So now you look at the three together and then make a diagnosis whether. So I think the results would be available maybe sometime in a couple of years time or a month's time, I don't know when, when they have uh, calculated, uh, accumulated enough data, probably they'll publish it. So I think that uh, the answer to your question will probably uh, come in, you know, in the coming years, uh, where we'll yes. see what happens with those. Yes, thank, th thank you. Shushmita, Chandrima, do you have anything to add to this? No, I think uh, that's, I mean, the more you add, the more information your brain gets, the more you'll be able to, so uh, a suspicion. But then uh, just one caveat that it shouldn't be the other way around. So usually you see the fields and then you try to correlate the disk with that. It's always better if you have a pre- pre-test probability and then see the field and then see whether you know it correlates or not. And the other point is if we learn, as, as Dr. Panda keeps teaching us, if we learn to look at the rim properly, you would also have a fair idea of where you expect your fields to be. So if, if the rim loss, for instance, is more towards the horizontal, you're a little more worried because then the field effects tend to be more central and you're looking at probably a normal tension glaucoma even if the pressures are normal. So just a good disc evaluation would sort of give you an idea of where the perimetry is supposed to or is likely to be. And if it's not there, then you're on firmer footing that this is either not reliable or he needs to learn it better. So I think the heart is a is a good disc evaluation first and then go on to fields. Yeah. All right. I agree with you. Sure. Is that complete? Because I think disc evaluation is the cornerstone of clinical glaucoma diagnosis. And I actually just use a line for my fellows is that when they first learn how to actually uh, look at a disc, I tell them like, I think once Shushmita had shown also that it's a donut, basically. So the center hollow is not important. The donut, the, the rim is important. important. <laughs> yes, the chocolate is important. So, you know, look at the rim. And with the rim only, you actually write your cup disc ratio. You minus the uh, the total rim from the one. So that is what is important for you. That's what I tell them, not the whole there. Don't look at that and then say, this is the cup disc ratio. So basically it is the cornerstone of glaucoma clinical diagnosis, disc evaluation. Okay. So uh, I'll take a couple of more questions. And one of them is, that if we see the anterior trabecular meshwork on gonioscopy not deepening on indentation, normal intraocular pressure, can we safely dilate to see the disc actually? There's a little conflict in this question, but I'd just like you to. Hmm? Surinder? See the anterior not deepening on indentation. Yes. So what we are seeing is that the anterior part of the trabecular meshwork is Visible. It's visible. 
is visible, but it's but you can't see the posterior even on indentation. So maybe an appositional closure. Then can we dilate? Okay. But how is the configuration? I mean, is it lati virus kind of configuration or is the regular one? You just need I, to I uh, expand on the without going into i mean without going to a lot of complexities uh, i think um, uh, you know if it's a high risk uh, individual for glaucoma point of view i would like to dilate and see the test and monitor his iop explain to the patient that we are going to put drops pressure may go up but don't worry we can take care of that the important thing here is that uh, you monitor the pressure after dilating as well Okay, uh, I'll go on to perhaps uh, what may be the last question of the day and my apologies to some of the questions that we're not going to be able to take up today. Uh, does the vertical CD ratio, uh, is it an important parameter in disk evaluation of glaucoma patient? Uh, it is actually an important parameter and uh, the only problem is that this tends to be a little bit of subjective and it has to be interpreted in view of the disk size. So the CD ratio could be interpreted, you know, uh, you know, differently. Like a larger disc could have a larger uh, CD ratio, and a small disc could have a smaller CD ratio, and still uh, they could be normal or abnormal. So that's the caveat here. So it tends to be subjective. Other thing is, it tends to be subjective. Uh, but it does tell you that in the given meridian, the vertical meridian, if you say 70.7 CD ratio, it says that you know the the rim tissue is or the neural tissue is there. Uh, occupying 30% of that and 70% is, is not there. So it gives you a little proportion of how much is the neural tissue in that given meridian is there. So it does give you that, but it is being subjective. So that's why uh, people uh, kind of, uh, they, I mean, we use CD ratio as uh, as a one of the parameters, but we also understand that it's not very reliable. Now, having said that, if we look at the GON project data, when we looked at it and we looked at the CD ratio, uh, you know, how it performed, uh, towards the diagnosis and we did find that people who got the cd ratio wrong they more often missed the diagnosis or made error in the diagnosis so that means cd ratio does play a role uh, in leading to uh, towards the glaucoma diagnosis so this is an important sign uh, to be looked for but uh, you understand the limitations of the cd ratio that have to be known so keep in mind the size of the disc is important when you are interpreting the cd ratio Thank you. Uh, any uh, any other points, Dr. Chandrima and Dr. Shushmita? Uh, so one thing is, uh, just one uh, thing that sir also uh, brought out, that the CD ratio has to be uh, kept in mind uh, in view of the disc size. Because for a very small disc, even a 0.5 CD ratio might be very, very glaucomatous. Whereas we've always seen that the major disc suspects that are referred to as 0 0.7, 0 0.8 cups actually have very large discs. So I think one of the first things for a young ophthalmologist to start looking at is at least start measuring the discs. And I tell our residents that if you measure about 100 of them only, then your brain will know what is less than average and what is larger than average. You don't need to measure each one of them. But it's very important to get that right. We've had so yeah. many glaucomas in small discs being missed because the CD ratio is 0.6. So that's not important so much as the rim is. So that's just one yeah. point more. Yeah, Chandrima, do you want to say something? Every totally, absolutely, because uh, for uh, small discs, that's where we miss glaucoma. Larger discs, we generally don't. So that's very important that we actually uh, look at the CD ratio in small discs, very important. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, all of you, Dr. Surinder, Dr. Shushmita, Dr. Chandrima, for being with us today. And I think that, uh, you know, it was really a very, very clinical uh, talk and, uh, and discussion. And uh, I'm so delighted that, uh, that all of you were with us today. Thank you very much. And uh, we look forward to the next occasion of uh, joining all of you together. Thank you. Thank Bye -bye. you. Thank you for having us. Thank you. 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 Thank you.